Um, at my, my most recent work, I was at Google uh, Quantum AI working on their hardware team as a research intern. Um, and as, as Lexi mentioned, I'm the president of the Stanford Quantum Computing so Association. And we're kind of a new association, about two years old. But we've grown rather rapidly to about 700 members um, with half undergraduates and half graduates and some faculty and staff on there as well. And our, our main focus is trying to build a community at Stanford of quantum, I guess, enthusiasts. Um, both people who are new, like a freshman, sophomore, who don't know anything about quantum, maybe nothing about like in quantum physics, but then also like a place for graduate students to work on projects, open source projects, um, a boot camps, potentially competitions, um, and actually create like technical research there. Um, and so this year um, we've expanded a, a ton with new committees and a new leadership team, and we're hoping to have a lot more, I guess, activities that deal with like companies and corporate activities where instead of having speakers talk in workshops, we have like real connections and projects with say, Google, IBM, Microsoft, et cetera. Um, very excited to be here and I hope we can contribute to quantum conversations and learn a lot from you guys as well. Alexi, I think you're muted. Yeah, it's early in the morning. Uh, Thank you, thank you, Jeremiah. So, uh, yes, you know, uh, we hope to get more folks from Stanford Quantum to join us, uh, you know, as the meetings go on and we want to do join events like a panel or something. So on your guys, you know, welcome to propose topics. So uh, at this point, uh, it will just, you know, continue the introductions again, like we'll play the game of me trying to go in order of names on Zoom, not repeating uh, them more than once. Uh, if I do, I apologize. If I miss somebody, I will ask at the end folks to, to say a few words. So let, you know, uh, say a few words about yourself, what you do as usual and what, you know, what you hope to, to learn uh, in, in these conversations. Uh, I'll just uh, uh, start going down the list. Uh, John Stainton. Welcome, John. Hi, good morning out west to everybody in San Francisco. So I'm here from Canada. So I've been on uh, quite a few of these uh, quantum by the bay sessions. So I'm an engineer at IBM in Canada. So I work with Scotiabank, which is a large uh, global bank. There is a team at Scotiabank that do quantum computing. They currently do work with uh, Xanadu who have a photonic solution. And they're working on some additional use cases with um, uh, BBVA and some other organizations. So we're always just interested in meeting other people. So very happy to meet Jeremiah and the team. And we're continuing to try to spread our wings and meet other folks. For me, uh, I've been in IBM a very long time, probably longer than most of you have been alive. So um, I won't say how many years, but a long time. Uh, and my degree is in mathematics from 1974, if that gives you an idea. So uh, background in mathematics and comp sci, not quantum, but very interested in it. Thank you, Joanna. Welcome again. Uh, Nathan Sharma. Welcome, Nathan. Uh, hi, everyone. Yes, I'm a colleague of Andrea at Unitary Fund, so we'll not take too much uh, time. And I'm looking forward uh, to meeting you all. It looks like a great community. Thank you, Nathan. And thank you for all your help organizing and you know asking all the right questions to make this happen. Thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, looking forward to learn more about Unitary Fund from Andrea and what you guys are doing. Very interesting group. Uh, okay, uh, Nick Braun. Hey, how's it going? Um, I'm, I'm from IBM. I have a background in experimental quantum computing. I'm interested in quantum hardware and, uh, you know, everything else in general. Thank you, Nick. And Nick obviously spoke last time we have uh, the recording is up, by the way. All the recordings are going on functional.tv, which is a free YouTube channel, and the links are posted on the Quantum Conversations website. So if you if you miss something, you can always go back, and by this time, you should have the, the video link there. Uh, Ali Shirnia. Welcome, Ali. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm calling from London. Uh, it's, uh, I think, the second session. Uh, maybe the first thing that I've been on. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the possibility of actually interacting with uh, fellow researchers and uh, practitioners uh, uh, around the world. Um, I have a company called uh, Quantum Thinking Machine, and uh, we are uh, building a 
I, I can't say much about it, but uh, I think uh, I can say uh, a, a few words. The fact that we are building the Photonic Phase uh, Universal Quantum Computer, that's one of the projects that we're involved in, and uh, with specific uh, design um, related to artificial uh, neural networks and uh, implementation of perceptrons in, uh, in the quantum field. That, that's what we're building right now. And, uh, it, it, is a, it is a big challenge, especially with the planet. But, uh, but anyway, there we are. Thank you, thank you, Ali. And uh, you have an interesting video set up. I see you have uh, like a camera with face recognition square on it and histogram. Well, yeah, it's so, uh, you know, I spent $100 not to buy a $20 uh, um, uh, webcam. So, uh, so that's why it's all, uh, it's all like this. I got I to gotta tune it up. Nice, nice, nice. Welcome. Uh, Amir Ibrahimi. Amir, I think you're on mute, Amir. I was on mute. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, my name is Amir. I work at Unity Technologies in our Barracuda Group. It's a optimized CPU GPU inference engine for Unity, and uh, just bootstrapping on Quantum until I can do something useful for the community. Thanks. That's great. Welcome, Amir. Hi, Amir. Uh, now, uh, let's see, Andrew Troitsky. Uh, let me speak from Andrew Troitsky because he has some bad connection with uh, mics uh, and this video. We are from the same group. We are from Russian Quantum Center and we are developing the quantum cloud computing uh, platform for access, remote access to the quantum computer. And we... Uh -huh. We're ready to, uh, welcome to join. Uh, so, so thank you very much for invitation. Uh, so let's talk and discuss what we will see in near future of quantum computing. Sounds great. Welcome Anton and welcome Andrew. Uh, hope to learn Thanks, more Mark. about your work. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Debasish Banerjee. Hi, Alexi. Hi, everyone. This is my second uh, Quantum Conversations by the Bay session. Um, I'm a particle physicist based in Berlin, and um, I'm interested in trying to use quantum, um, quantum simulation, uh, mostly analog, but also digital, to solve problems in, in particle physics. So, in fact, one of the things I'm looking forward to in today's one conversation is the use of MITIC. So, together with Emily, who is also here in the audience uh, today, we are um, kind of designing quantum circuits and, you know, we would try to, um, you know, decrease the decoherence and, and try to solve some problems. That's, the, this is, these are things we cannot do on classical computers. Um, so yeah, we are trying to um, learn this method and, and, and apply. So yeah, I'm looking forward to, to, to today's discussions. Thank you. Great, welcome to uh, Ryan LaRose. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm also a colleague of Andreas at Unitary Fund, so I'm, I'm here to support his talk. Welcome. Uh, Daniel Mills. Hi, thanks for the introduction. Uh, yeah, so I'm Dan. I work at Cambridge Quantum Computing, so based in Cambridge primarily, but we have bases in London and elsewhere. Um, I did my PhD in quantum computing, I'm an undergraduate in mathematics before that, and I'm here today to talk a bit about uh, benchmarking quantum devices and verification and things like that. So thanks for having me. Great. Uh, welcome, Daniel. So we, you know, we have, as usual, pretty long day. So Daniel second, uh, is the second speaker. So, you know, and basically, you know, we start right after we wrap up the introductions with the first talk and then you will go second. We can do some, some uh, general discussion in the middle. So, you know, if you're joining us late, uh, do not, you know, leave us until you get to hear Daniel speak. Uh, because I think today's program is really, really interesting. So looking forward to this. Uh, Sebastian Hassinger. Yes. Hey, Lexi. Um, uh, I, I, I'm, I run the... Uh, 
partnership programs for IBM Quantum, including academic partnerships. So um, uh, we've been sponsoring Alexi as he gets this uh, interesting workshop series up and running. So we we'll see everybody. Yes, yes thank you, Sebastian. And uh, I, you know, I think it's really uh, great how you know we we have uh, such a great program today. It just shows you know some of this comes from the introductions from partners like IBM. Some folks just you know step forward, like Cambridge and 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 offer talks. And I you know I really hope we can continue in that sense. Right, we kind of we have a things like at least three or four months kind of uh, potentially planned, but we we have room because we have two talks. So again, if you want to to give a talk at the next event, please let me know and uh, we, we definitely will make it happen. Uh, let's see, Emily Hoffman. Uh, yes, hi. So uh, you heard a little bit about me from Devishish as well, but I'm a physicist uh, close to Toronto and I work at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. I'm interested in quantum simulation and uh, application of uh, yeah, simulating strongly correlated systems that are of interest to particle physics and condensed matter. Great. Welcome again. Uh, Vojko Tomut. Hi. Hi. I'm a student in physics and I just joined from a uh, link to from Amir. Nice. Uh, where are you students? Uh, where, where do you study physics? I'm studying in Romania uh -huh. at UBB Cluj. Great, great. Uh, Buna Sara. Buna Sara. Welcome. Uh, oh. uh, Veselin Georgiev. Good morning, Alex. Uh, good morning, everyone. My background is uh, nuclear and theoretical physics, and uh, I'm located in California, interested in quantum computing, working on uh, actually addressing uh, practical problems uh, using quantum computers. For example, what is efficient uh, vaccine distribution once the vaccines are available? And that's one of the things that I'm interested at the moment. If anyone knows something about that, uh, please feel free to contact me. Thank great, you. great. Well, great to have you again. I hope you are safe uh, given all the fire situation. So uh, great, great to have everyone. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's see. I uh, I think we covered uh, everyone, but Andrea uh, and uh, Andrea is going to speak now. Uh, the first talk, right? So is is um, is everybody missing? Uh, please say a few words about yourself if I miss anybody. Uh, I think we covered everyone. All right. So let's uh, then uh, proceed uh, with our first talk. So we have uh, Andre Murray from uh, Unitary Funds. And I'm really, uh, and Nathan, uh, his colleague uh, as well. So I'm really, you know, uh, curious about this organization. I see you guys do micro grants and there is a whole research agenda. So it's really great to have you with us. So take it away, Andrew, and tell us all about your work and what Unitary Fund does. Okay, okay. Hello, everyone. So um, basically the best way, I, I guess, is to start by sharing my screen because I have a few slides about unitary fund, so you can know what we are doing. And I will start by sharing the screen. Okay. So actually the presentation that I'm going to give is about a software library, which is called Mythic. Mm -hmm. But I also have a couple of slides about a unitary fund because mm -hmm. I think uh, most of you don't know what it is and it's good if I explain what we are doing. So uh, Unitary Fund is a nonprofit organization which is uh, legally uh, localized in the US, but it's actually completely remote and distributed. And indeed I'm working from, from Italy as I was discussing before. And basically the aim of Unitary Fund is uh, divided in two main blocks. The first aim, the first task, is to run a microgrant program which gives uh, $4,000 to open quantum technology projects. So if any student, any 
postdoc or any researcher, senior researcher wants to implement a particular small scale open source project, which could be software, could be educational and so on, can apply for, for a grant of $4,000. And I invite you if you have some ideas to apply because it's a very interesting project. Uh, on the other hand, we also have an internal unitary lab in which we do our own uh, original research to help the quantum ecosystem. And for example, we are building a library which is called Mythic, and that's what I'm going to present. And, and we also do like uh, standard uh, theoretical research on, on quantum software and, and quantum information in general. So the, the Unitary Fund uh, uh, team is with the people that you see here. So me, uh, Nathan, Peter, Ryan, Sarah, that just joined the team, and Will, who is actually the, the founder of Unitary Fund. And then we have also uh, an advisory board, which is made of 15 experts in quantum systems and quantum software. And they are volunteers. So they, they just help us uh, essentially to review all the grant applications that we receive and they are uh, from all the different companies and academic institutions around the world. And plus, we also have like a community of people uh, working more or less in this field, which are mainly based, composed of um, people involved in these grants. So uh, we have already 40 grant winners, which are connected somehow with the Unitary Fund. And yeah, so this is a very short introduction on what Unitary Fund is. And then uh, in the rest of this presentation, I'm going to focus on what we did uh, in terms of research and also in terms of uh, software. In particular, uh, I'm going to present this Mythic library. So this is the, the outline of, of the presentation. I'm going to give a a simple introduction to the idea of zero noise extrapolation, which is an error mitigation method for quantum computers. Then I'm going to give a, an overview of the Mythic library, which is a Python library for doing error mitigation. And eventually I will try to give some uh, live tutorial on how to use Mythic with a Jupyter notebook. So let me start with zero noise extrapolation. So the, one of the main problems of current quantum computers is that they are noisy. You know this very well. And today there is a very simple error correction method which is cross your fingers and hope that your computation will go as you expect. And uh, in the very far future, we expect that we hope to reach a situation in which we have a full tolerant quantum computer in which uh, basically the error is, uh, goes to zero, but you have also a large overhead in terms of qubits and in terms of uh, classical uh, post-processing, which means that uh, likely this, this is not going to happen in the next five or 10 years for sure. And so we need something uh, in the middle, something which can mitigate errors, but uh, maybe in a less rigorous and less efficient way, but still can give uh, good results without too much overhead. So something that can be applied with quantum computers that we have today. And there are many methods which are called in general error mitigation methods. And one of these methods is called zero noise extrapolation. And this is what uh, I'm going to present today. But there are also other methods like probabilistic error cancellation, uh, randomized compiling, dynamical decoupling, quantum optical control. And at some point, we hope to implement also these other methods in our new library that, I, that is called Mythic. So let me start with an introduction on zero noise extrapolation. 
So the, the best way is to start with a simple plot like this, in which we are plotting uh, an arbitrary expectation value. In this case, is the probability of measuring a qubit in the ground state. And uh, as a function of the noise level. Actually, it is as a function of a noise scale factor lambda, which means that when lambda is equal to one, we are evaluating an expectation value at the noise of the hardware. And because of this, it means that we are not able to measure the expectation value in this region when lambda is less than one. But we would like to know what is the ideal expectation value at lambda equal to zero. But the only point that we have is this one. So the idea of zero noise extrapolation is to, instead of trying to reduce the noise, you can increase it because that's usually much easier than reducing it. And you can have a lot of more points evaluated for the same observable, but at different noise levels. These are kind of random fluctuations around some kind of mean value. And by the way, these are real data taken by, with an IBM computer. And then what you can do is just extrapolate what is the infer what is the inference for the zero noise limit. So essentially you do a kind of best fit and you look for the limit of this orange line for lambda equal to zero. And this is your guess for the expected ideal zero noise expectation value. So as you can expect, uh, there, there are two main problems to uh, implement zero noise extrapolation. The, the first problem is uh, noise scaling. So how do we scale the noise? And the second problem is how do we infer from these blue points what is the zero noise limit? We call this the inference, inference uh, step of zero noise extrapolation. So uh, I, I just anticipate that these two main problems are uh, addressed in MITIC, which is the library that I'm going to present later, uh, by two uh, uh, specific modules. One is called MITIC zero noise extrapolation scaling and MITIC zero noise extrapolation inference. But later I'm going to explain more about this. And now I, I just want to explain a bit more what we mean by noise scaling. So uh, actually the idea was you know, originally proposed in this paper by IBM in which they assume that the system is described, is described by a master equation. So a time evolution equation for the state of the system of the qubits, which is described by a Hamiltonian part, which is like the ideal dynamics that you expect from your control of the qubits. However, you also have an interaction with the environment, which is going to destroy the quantum evolution a little bit. So to, to disturb it, and that's can be described by a noise operator acting on the state. And if you are a theorist, it's very easy to scale the noise of the system. You, you just add uh, a constant lambda in front of, of the noise operator. And, and then you can easily evaluate a noiseless evolution by just setting lambda equal to zero. You can evaluate the hardware uh, dynamics by setting lambda equal to one. And you can easily, for example, double the noise by setting lambda equal to two. And so this is of course very easy, but the question is, how can you do the same noise scaling if you are an, an experimentalist? So it's not so easy as it seems. So let's see what an experimentalist can do. So of course it cannot uh, put lambda equal to zero because you don't have a perfect quantum computer. So you always have noise at least at a value of lambda equal to one. You can uh, evaluate the, the, the standard dynamics, standard noise of the system. Of course, you just run the experiment, but already if you want to double the noise acting on the system, it's not so easy because usually you don't have 
control over the, over the noise. That's the main problem. And so the, the proposal which was given in, in this original paper by the IBM team was uh, to, instead of scaling uh, up the noise, uh, you can scale down the Hamiltonian. So if the Hamiltonian is K, you, you evolve the system with an, an Hamiltonian K prime, which is one over lambda K. And in order to recover the same dynamics, you also have to scale the, the duration, the time length of, of the pulses. And so in practice, you just have to stretch all the physical control pulses that you are sending to the qubits. In this way, you get a dynamics which is lower, and so you ac accumulate a larger amount of noise. And what we try to propose with our uh, theory paper that you see here is a digital approach to do some kind of, the same kind of noise scaling, but not acting at the level of physical control pulses, but acting at the level of a gate, of a circuit level. So what you can actually program with a standard uh, quantum software platform. And the basic trick which is behind this method is called unitary folding, which uh, uh, basically consists of taking a unitary G and replacing it with G, G dagger G to the power of N. And since uh, G dagger G is equal to the identity for any unitary operation. This object is actually equivalent to the input object in a noiseless uh, scenario. However, it's, it contains more gates. And so we expect that when you run this object on the right hand side with a real hardware, you get more noise. And uh, of course you can apply this trick to individual gates and in principle you can also apply the same operation the same unitary folding operation to the entire circuit in any case you increase the length and the depth of the circuit and so you increase the amount of noise and then the main assumption which is behind this approach is that if you if you apply unitary folding the noise is scaled by a factor of lambda equal to one plus two n, where n is this exponent here. So in practice, you hope to scale the noise by all odd integers, uh, assuming that the noise is more or less proportional to the number of gates that you are applying into the system. And uh, at the first note is that uh, you can prove that this assumption is exactly correct for the polarizing noise. And it is usually a good approximation, but of course it is still a matter of research uh, to understand when this assumption holds and when it's violated and so on. But it seems to work with real hardware. So uh, it's quite promising. Uh, another comment is that uh, it seems that in this way you can only scale the noise by, by integer factors, but you can also scale uh, by any arbitrary real number larger than one by simply uh, applying a unitary folding to a subset of, this, of the gates and to a subset of the circuit. So just to clarify a bit the idea of this, of this folding trick, here I'm going to present a, an example which is based on a circ, uh, circuit which is uh, composed of a quantum register of two qubits. And the circuit is made of a Hadamard gate applied to the first qubit and a control knot applied to both qubits. And if this is your input circuit, you can try to apply a global folding, for example, with a scale factor of three. And this is what Mythic is can do by using the, the scaling uh, module. And this is the output. As you can see, the, the depth of the circuit is scaled by a factor of three. It has three times more gates. And uh, ideally the unit is the same because this is G, G dagger G, which is equal to the original circuit. But if you run this on a real hardware, you expect to have three times more noise 
with respect to the previous one. And there is also, as I said before, more freedom uh, in the way in which you do this folding. For example, you can fold individual gates instead of folding the full circuit. This is an example in which we fold only the first gate. And so we get a scale factor of two because the depth of this circuit is four while the depth of this circuit is two. And we, there is a lot of options to, do, to apply this trick. And all these options are in this module Mythic ZNE scaling. Uh, however, I have to say a few words about the second part. So given this uh, noise scaled expectation value, how can we infer the zero noise limit? How do we do this uh, extrapolation? And the original proposal, which is again in this initial paper by, by the IBM research team, was to use uh, Richardson extrapolation. And if you are not familiar with this technique, you can explain it because it's quite uh, simple. You can, you can expect that your expectation value, arbitrary expectation value, is a function of this lambda, which is the noise level of your system. And in principle, it's, you can expand in a Taylor series, these expectation values in powers of lambda and assuming that we truncate this series to an order three in the noise level. Uh, and of course, we are able to measure this only at values of lambda larger than one, but we are interested in E0, so the value, the zero noise limit. And the way in which we can evaluate this is to take a few measurements at different values of lambda in such a way that we have a kind of a system of linear equations that, and we can solve it for E0, which is our uh, zero noise extrapolation. And in this case, for example, you get this result, which means that by simply taking a linear combination of your noisy expectation values, you can recover the noiseless limit, of course, up to truncation errors and statistical errors and so on. So this is Richardson extrapolation. And however, we tried also to uh, generalize a bit this approach by proposing a, a more general inference, statistical inference approach, which is based on a kind of probabilistic model. So assume that we have a kind of statistical model for the expectation value as a function of lambda and also as a function of some model parameters that we don't know. For example, this could be a polynomial, an exponential, I don't know. And then we, f we take data. So we take some blue points of the expectation value for different values of lambda and we fit the model. We try to uh, deduce the optimal parameters which best describe our measurements. And given the best fit model, we extrapolate the zero noise limit. And of course, depending on, on the model, you can get many different extrapolation, uh, extrapolation strategies. If the model is a polynomial, you get polynomial extrapolation. You can get an exponential extrapolation. You can also recover Richardson extrapolation as a particular case of a polynomial extrapolation with the maximum degree. And also you have some freedom in, in, in the way in which you do, you collect the data. So you, you can use a static fit or an adaptive fit in which you choose the noise scale factors uh, uh, in, a, in an adaptive way, depending on intermediate uh, results. So all these methods are contained in the MITIC ZNE inference module and can be easily imported and used with, with MITIC. And the reason why we have all so many methods is that it's not clear. It, it is still a matter of research, which method is better, which method works, which method doesn't work. And actually what we observed from our experiments is that it really depends on the problem, but even more 
For the same problem, it can depend on the particular hardware. For example, this is exactly the same experiment run on IBM Q London of a randomized benchmarking circuit whose expectation values in principle is one. And we see that here, this uh, violet point, so the exponential extrapolation works very well. Uh, on the other hand, with a Rigetti experiment, with a Rigetti backend, we see that the red point is better. So like the quadratic extrapolation gives better results. So uh, I think is this explains why it's probably good to have a library in which you can easily switch between different methods and check which one is working better for, for the particular problems that you are trying to address. So here are some kind of benchmarking that we try to run. I don't go into the details, but we try to understand how different scaling methods and different extrapolation methods combine and what's their performance. And the take home message is that it really depends. They more or less work very well compared to uh, not mitigating at all, but which one is better really depends on the particular noise model and problem. So I can, I can now present, uh, by the way, maybe that's a good moment to, to ask question if you have on this zero noise extrapolation part. Otherwise I can go on with the rest. I have a question. Yeah, ask questions, yeah. So earlier you talk about mitigating uh, for various types of gates. And for example, you have the single qubit gates as well as the two qubit, the C naught gates. And then when you discuss the lambda value, um, you say that you can have a lambda value of two if you just deal with the single qubit gate, but then a lambda value of three if you include the two qubit gate as well. But doesn't the two qubit gate contain a variety of gates um, on the, for yeah. example, with the IBM hardware uh, for the superconducting qubits? Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. So. Uh, this was just a very simple example, which actually is not uh, a very appropriate one from a physical point of view, because actually I was scaling the first gate, which usually is much less noisy than the two mm -hmm. qubit gates. So this just to explain how the technique works. But uh, of course, uh, if you are interested in scaling, for example, only the noise, uh, acting on a two on a two qubit gate, so if you want to take into account how, how much error you have in your gates, you can do it by specifying like the the average fidelity of each gate. It's an option, okay. uh, an additional option that you can give. I and, see. And you can also exclude the folding of uh, single qubit gates if you want. You can say you can say to Mythic to just consider two qubit gates. And this is going to to work uh, better, maybe. Uh, anyway, I, I just want to point out that, uh, for example, let me show this example here, in which you have a, a lambda equal to three, and we are folding a control knot three times, and also the Hadamard three times. And so this means that uh, independently on, on how large is, uh, is, uh, the, um, is the noise on the, of the control knot or of the single qubit gates, since we are folding all the gates right. um, on average, so not on average, actually, uh, we, uh, we are uh, in some sense scaling the noise by a factor of three independently on what is the base level of the noise. So if, if H has a noise of zero, this is still okay because adding three H gates is still <laughs> equivalent mm -hmm. to having a, a zero noise on, on a single uh, H gate. Yeah, I was very happy with this example. It was okay. the, then looking at the <laughs> lambda equals two uh, and your yeah, next yeah, slide. Yeah, yeah. But... I, 
I agree. I agree. Yes, I agree. So if there are no other questions, I can go on with the second part, which is a more high level overview of the software. So the, the, let me start with the standard situation that you usually have when you use uh, one of the typical quantum software libraries like Kiskit, Circon, Rigetti. Uh, usually there is a user interface in which you define your quantum program and then you send it to a kind of backend which is on the cloud which can be IBM Q, Rigetti, or it could even be a classical simulator. You could even use Qtip for doing a low level uh, pulse uh, level uh, simulations. And once you get the result, you recover the expectation value. So this is the typical workflow. And the idea of Mythic is to sit in the middle between the user and the hardware. So it's a kind of intermediate layer, which in some sense is very similar to a compiler. Uh, on the other hand, it works in the opposite direction of a compiler, because as we have seen before, we are trying to give a program to de-optimize it, to, to increase the number of gates, to, to have a larger amount of noise. And this kind of scaling is performed by this uh, noise scaling module, which given an input circuit, produces a list of uh, circuits with, with more and more gates. So uh, there is a kind of noise scaled uh, copy of the same circuit. And all these circuits are then executed with a backend, which actually has nothing to do with Mythic. So Mythic just uses it as a black box and so this is the reason why it is compatible with, a, with a virtually any kind of backend which is able to execute circuits. And then Mythic collects the results and gives to the user the mitigated expectation value. So this is the structure of the package. Uh, there are some tools which are related to uh, conversions for Qiskit circuits, PyQuill circuits. And then there is this zero noise module, which contains the noise scaling and the inference sub packages. So we, we have recently put on the archive a white paper where you can see more details. If you are interested, the, the, the library is already at this at disposal at the PyPy uh, repository. So you can install it with pip install mythic. Or if you're interested in the source code, this is on GitHub. And just a few information about this library. Uh, it's a very recent, so we started this year to develop it. And it's we are trying to test as much as possible our code and we use continuous integration on different platforms, Linux, Mac, and Windows. And all the functions are documented in this uh, documentation link that you see here. And the documentation itself is automatically tested. So we try to, to make everything as stable as possible. This is the roadmap uh, for the future. Now we have only zero noise extrapolation, but we hope to implement probabilistic error cancellation very soon. And also to support additional backends like uh, Qtip or Open Pulse and Qiskit Pulse. So again, if you have other questions on this general overview, we can uh, wait a little bit. Otherwise I will jump to the a Jupyter Notebook. I'll ask a question. Yes. Um, do you have any criteria for determining which extrapolation method one would, would use? Uh, it's a good question. So for the moment, 
we don't have a criteria. So basically it's an open research question. And the good thing is that it's very easy to switch between different extrapolation methods. And so if you're, if you're solving a problem for which more or less you know what you expect, you can check which method is working better. Otherwise, I agree that it's a very hard and interesting problem to, to understand a priori which method one should use. But we are working also on this, on trying to automatically understand what's the optimal way of doing it. So I think we can go to the tutorial. And by the way, if I'm going, uh, if I'm running out of time, you can stop it uh, as you want. I'm, I'm not sure how much time still I still have. Uh, you're good, you're good. Uh, we basically allocate about an hour to a talk and questions. So, you know, we have. We have yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I did almost half an hour, right? Well, I'm not sure, okay. Let's see, let's start with this tutorial. Maybe we can stop in the middle if we don't need to complete it. Anyway, uh, this is what you need to do if you want to install Mythic, just uh, run the command pip install Mythic. And if you want to install one of the software libraries, you can also do it. And later you can check if everything is working okay by importing mythic and using the mythic about function which tells you all the dependencies of mythic its version and all the dependencies so the only thing that i want to stress is that here you see pyquil and kiskit but it doesn't mean that you need to have installed all these pyquil kiskit libraries so depending on which one you have in your computer Mythic will just use what you have already installed. It's compatible with, with, with everything, but you don't have to install everything. And, and another important top issue is that uh, circ instead is used for the internal uh, representation of circuits and gates. So this is actually a requirement of, of Mythic. And so what, what we need to do in order to implement zero noise extrapolation? We need to do three main uh, steps. We need to define a circuit, of course. This is the, what you will do anyway, with, even without zero noise extrapolation. Then we need to define a function that executes a circuit and gives you an expectation value. So this function is called an executor and it's a very important topic for Mythic. It's, it's what encapsulates your hardware as a black box in such a way that Mythic can call this black box in a hardware independent way. And then you can use one of the functions that are in the zero noise extrapolation module to get the zero noise limit. So let's try, let's try to do it. In this case, I, I make a very simple example which is based on Qiskit. I import Qiskit and we can uh, define a, a register of just two qubits and two classical bits in which we are going to store the measurements of the two qubits and we initialize the circuit and we apply the gates. So the circuit just to, to show a very simple example is extremely simple. It's a uh, 40 control knot gates. One has a sequence of control knot gates. And since they are an even number of gates, in principle, this circuit is equal to the identity. And we expect to find the qubits in the zero zero state. But of course, because of noise, they are not going to be always in the zero zero state. So this is the circuit, very, very, boring circuit, all control knots and two measurements. And now we define the executor. 
So as I said before, this is a function which takes a quantum circuit and gives you an expectation value. And, and, and the user is completely free to define this function uh, in any way, in any possible way. And in this case, I just give you an example. So if you use a real hardware and you want to use Qiskit, you can use the standard approach of executing circuits with a Qiskit. So you have to initialize a provider. Then you get, uh, you have to, uh, yes, initialize also a backend, which you can take from the provider, in which case we use this backend here. And then we are ready to define our executor function, which takes a quantum circuit and execute it with a Qiskit execute method with the, with the backend that we had just initialized. And an important uh, remark is that we set optimization level to zero, which means that we try to avoid uh, uh, too much uh, simplifications to much uh, optimization of the circuits because if you use unitary folding and then the circuit is simplified this kind of unitary folding is cancelled so we don't want this and that's we, we remove uh, this compilation level uh, step and so then we take the measurement counts and we check how many times we get the zero zero result which is the expected ideal result and so we compute essentially an expectation value. And just to, to monitor the execution, we also print the result each time we call this function. Uh, yes. And by the way, since we, now we are not going to use the real hardware, I just defined exactly the same executor with a kind of uh, fake hardware, which, which can import from, from Qiskit. And this is just to simulate a real hardware execution in a classical way. And you can, we can just try to use the executor. So we take the input circuit, which is the one made of 40 control nodes that we defined before. We execute it and we get an expectation value of 0 0.8, which is not one, which is the expected result. And the reason is that, of course, we have noise and the circuit is long, and so there is some error here. And now we are ready to, to use Mythic. So once you are, you are in this situation, using Mythic at the basic level is extremely simple because the only thing that you have to do is to import the zero noise extrapolation module, ZNE. And then you can call the function execute with ZNE, which takes as input the original circuit and the executor, which is this function which executes circuits. Both objects here are defined by the user. And now Mythic is going to call the executor and to scale the circuit and to produce the mitigated expectation value. And for example, this is the result. As you, as you can see, it's 0 0.93. Of course, there are some fluctuations each time you do it. But anyway, it's much better than 0 0.84. And so we are, we are using error mitigation in an automatic way. So what, what is doing Mythic uh, behind the scenes? So what you don't see here is that Mythic is internally scaling the input circuit here using unitary folding with scale factors one, two, and three. And then Mythic is calling using the executor uh, with this scale, noise scale circuits three times because we scale the noise by a factor of one, two, and three. And each time you call the executor, you get an expectation value. And in this, this is the print message, which is generated by the executor. Because here we have this print expectation value here. So what you see here are the individual noisy expectation values. As you see, they are decreasing, but then you can uh, extrapolate 
with the Richardson extrapolation from these three numbers to the zero noise limit and you get this. So everything is done in an automatic way. However, if you want, you can tune the details uh, with, with a much more um, freedom of choosing the scaling method and the inference method. So this is what I'm, I'm going to show now. For example, uh, what, what I said before in, in the presentation is that there are different ways of scaling the noise and all these different ways are inside the scaling method. For example, here I'm in initializing a noise scaling method which is called fold gates at random that takes a subset of, a random subset of gates and it, it applies unitary folding to this subset. Then we can also choose an inference method. For example, a Richardson extrapolation with the scale factors that we just decide here, one, two, three, and four, for example. And then we can pass these two objects, the noise scaling method and inference method as options for the execute with Zeni, the functions that we used before. And as you can see, we get a similar, I mean, even better, uh, okay, it was a fluctuation, <laughs> even better result than before. And, uh, and of course, here you are free to choose a different noise scaling method. For example, here you see that you can choose fold global, which is the one that I have also shown in the slides. And also the inference method can be changed. Uh, for example, we can use, I don't know, uh, ex exponential extrapolation. And let's see. Okay, the result is not very different in this case, but uh, anyway, you, there is a lot of freedom here. You can also change the scale factors. You can add another one uh, and, and so on. Okay, this is uh, about uh, scaling method and, and, and inference methods. And there are even more details, but uh, I'm not sure if I should go more into the details. Maybe I can stop here and uh, wait for any questions and in general, on, on this part or on the previous part. Okay, otherwise I can just quickly show that uh, the library, as I said, you is compatible not just with Qiskit but you can define exactly the same circuit with circ or with PyQuill and all the scale, noise scaling methods that, for example, uh, fold global scaling method that we have seen in the slides are compatible with any kind of uh, the previous circuits. For example, if I use circ, uh, circ, Circuit, let me see, uh -huh. no. Yes, as you can see, you, you can just input uh, a circuit of any type of the supported one. So Qiskit, PyQuill and, and, and Circ, and they work natively with any type. And also here, this is important for the question that was asked before, you can fold by fidelity. So you can also, input the fidelity of specific gates. So for example, here I'm using circ to generate a random circuit, which is made of four qubits, three moments. And as you can see, there are some single qubit gates and also a control knot and an eye swap gate here, which is a two qubit gate. And when we, when we use uh, a unitary folding function, in this case, fold gates at random, you can set the fidelities of all the single qubit gates to one, for example, which means that uh, Mythic is going to just forget about the single qubit gates since they are 
approximately ideal gates and is going to apply unitary folding only to these two qubit gates. And so let's see the result. And as you can see, single qubit gates are not folded while two qubit gates are all folded. And, and in principle, you can also input a dictionary with more specific fidelities for all the type of gates, but this is a very handy way of just setting all the qubit gates to a fidelity equal to one. And yeah, I don't want to go more into the details. The only thing that I want to say is that uh, the, the good thing of using a, an open source library is that you can customize it as much as you want. Uh, for example, you are free to define your own uh, custom uh, scaling method. If you don't like unitary folding as we uh, develop it, uh, you, you can define it in a di in different way. The important thing is that you have to use this a little bit. You have to follow the structure of our folding functions, but otherwise you are completely free to use different methods. And also you can define different inference methods. So we have an object which is called uh, a factory, which is a class that basically deals uh, with the inference uh, uh, of the extrapolation. So it, it collects all the results and, and it produces the fit and the zero noise limit. And so by simply creating a, a subclass of our factory, you can uh, define your own uh, extrapolation method. So with this, I think I can go to the conclusion which is, uh, I just explained a, a, a general overview of zero noise extrapolation. And I presented a, a, a high level overview of the mythic library. And also I tried to give some uh, examples with the Jupyter notebook. And thank you very much for, for, for the attention. Thank you, Andre, for the great uh, overview. Um, we have plenty of time for questions. Any questions? What is the group most um, excited about for future research? If you all are continuing, I suppose you would continue on the project. Um, yeah, so, uh, of course, we are uh, always interested in improving these uh, zero noise extrapolation methods. Maybe try to understand exactly in a more adaptive way, which method should be used, which scale, scale factors should be used in a more kind of uh, machine learning approach. Uh, on the other hand, we are also interested in more general error mitigation methods. Uh, of course, we want to implement in the software existing ideas also, because <laughs> that's the first thing to do. But uh, we are also interested in developing new methods, new error mitigation methods. Uh, in particular, in the probabilistic error cancellation uh, field, there is a lot of freedom and a lot of uh, unexplored research directions that we would like to to take in the future. Uh, I actually have a question, Andrea. So I, you know, I'm a software engineer by background, right? And kind of physicist in my previous life. So I'm really um, happy to see that you use continuous integration and uh, test coverage, which is not something I often see in data science folks. So I just yeah. wonder, you know, how, you know, uh, you kind of set it up this way. Do you have kind of strong software engineering background in your team? And how do you kind of reconcile these two kind of driving issues? You know, there is one research and quickly putting together prototypes and trying things, right? And like notebooks, who tests notebooks? Nothing runs, 
in production on notebooks, right? But on the other hand, you have this library, which is a software engineering project with test coverage, you know, with uh, uh, GitHub actions. So I'm, I'm very curious, how do you guys reconcile these two directions, science and kind of production quality? Yeah, so actually I think by, by training, we are all physicists, more or less, uh, if I'm not wrong, but <laughs> uh, we try to, to do all the best practices of uh, open source software uh, development. And uh, for continuous integration, we use uh, GitHub Actions. So it's a kind of built-in uh, integration tools that we have in GitHub. And for testing, we use uh, PyTest, which is also uh, very good for this. We use code coverage uh, uh, for, yes, for, for checking the coverage. Uh, well, we try to use this, the most popular tools for for open source software development, and uh, and there is also the experience of of, of Nathan and of Will uh, and of Peter. They, for example, Nathan work worked before on Kiskit. Nathan is here, by the way, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, uh, so some of us, maybe not me directly, so I'm not, are more expert on the research part, but <laughs> there are people in the team with a strong experience on open source and code development, even software engineering uh, techniques. So we try to do our best. <laughs> great, great. So, you know, I have another, maybe it's a question for Nathan, then uh, yeah. because we have, you know, a pretty big community of open source developers you know, in the Bay Area. And uh, I recently see a lot of interest from really traditional software developers like Postgres, database operators, you know, people want to get into quantum. And so the skills they have are open source development and maintaining kind of Bay Area internet infrastructure, right? And so they have spare cycles, they want to play with open source. Is there a pathway for them to play with Mythic and, uh, Contribute. I mean, obviously, one thing they can do is help with open source. If you have any issues which need helping with, right, uh, debugging, kind of, you know, purely like refactoring, things like, you know, people can do just being software engineers. But obviously, I think it's hard for them to just plunge in unless they also learn some quantum physics. And so I think there is a lot of people who kind of want to do both. They want to use their skills to help with open source. And during this, learn. So I just wonder if you guys are set up with this, if you have any cycles for mentorship, uh, can somebody help unitary fund work as a volunteer in order to get familiar with this field? If you, if there is any kind of community you, you have, like any, any way, like I can send these guys who want to learn and who want to kind of contribute. Uh, if you guys are set up to, to, to basically accept volunteers and teach them quantum. I mean, I, I, I'll, take, I'll take the question. Thanks, Alexi. And yeah, I mean, uh, first thing I will, I will paste here this link, uh, unitary.fund slash mythic. Mm -hmm. And you can sign up there to get uh, updates on uh, the software development. On the GitHub repository, which you can find at this link and Googling it. Um, we're setting up milestones where we are signing issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is not just for Unitary Fund uh, team, but anyone can contribute. And also we are like uh, um, uh, labeling these issues with good first issues and possibly also issues that do not require a quantum background. Mm -hmm. So. We're just starting with Mythic, so we don't have as many bugs, but of course, like creativity for enhanced features uh, can, be, can be broad. So I, I can bring as an example, in Qtip, we do have, uh, uh, which is another project I'm involved with, we do have, uh, and which I also recommend to folks that may be entering into quantum uh, and quantum physics, we do have uh, labels that are code and physics of course on github everything is code but the code label it's specifically um, there to 
to signify that you don't need the physics background to help there because maybe there is, as you said, some infrastructure bug or something they would like to improve in documentation. Where, uh, if you're interested, please do sign up at this uh, mailing list. I mean, it's not high frequency at all. And because there are also like updates, quarterly updates from the other unitary fund uh, projects. And we would like to see uh, as much as possible uh, uh, collaboration also from beyond uh, the core developers. Uh, also to other projects beyond Mythic. And with regard to Mythic, we're also going to set up other um, uh, communication channels so that folks can uh, quickly ask us uh, or the broader community if they have a bug or if something doesn't work with an installation. We're still thinking about whether going with Gitter or Slack. And again, there's like an open issue about that. So we have open issues for discussion and anyone is more than welcome to provide their feedback. And so this, this should help with uh, engaging a wider community. And by the way, I want to say hi to everyone. And uh, I didn't say it before, but it, it's great to see how diverse this, this community is and the different backgrounds. And so, uh, and I think it was also a great talk by him there. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Nathan. Really appreciate it. So the link is in the chat. Everybody can see that. Uh, Unitary.fun slash mythic and we'll share it on the on the website, obviously, so people can sign up. Yeah, this is great. I mean, this is exactly uh, where I hope to see, you know, uh, our community going because, you know, there are common issues we can work on and can send folks to that will, you know, be a good learning opportunity for everyone. So thank you, Nathan. Uh, this is great. Uh, I want to actually uh, welcome another a new um, member of the community. If uh... Hi, I'm, I'm sorry, can I ask a quick question? Of course, go for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask Andrea if it would be possible to share the uh, the the Python notebook uh, because uh, you know, like with Emily, as, as she said, we are actually implemented the quantum circuit and we have results. And essentially, we want to see how good these, how well these error mitigations work. And uh, and your notebook is is is, is it has explained things very nicely, so I was wondering if we can, uh, if it would be possible to share. Uh, so at the moment is not public, but we can we can think about this. Probably at some point we are going to add notebooks in the okay. library. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, of course you can contact with by mail, and I can send you. And and the same kind of functions that I used are also in the right. documentation. So okay. I'm not okay. doing okay. Uh, very special things in this notebook. Okay. So okay. Great. Uh, my suggestion is first, maybe uh, check in the documentation, but if you are really interested in this notebook, I, I can just send you, you can write me an email and- Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Devasis. Uh So I want to introduce another uh, member who joined us uh, uh, recently. Uh, uh, he's married as Khan and he also comes from Stanford Quantum. So he works with Jeremiah uh, on driving that organization. Merit, if you're here, maybe you can introduce yourself and say a few words about yourself. Yeah, of course. Thanks for introducing me, Alexi. Uh, hi, I am a master's student at Stanford. Um, I did my undergrad also at Stanford. In, I, I was a double major in physics and symbolic systems. So symbolic systems is a Stanford specific major. It's pretty interdisciplinary, uh, but it's mainly computer science. We also take some psychology and philosophy. People usually end up focusing on AI um, or cognitive science. And now I'm doing a master's in management science and engineering, but what I mostly took was um, stuff related to quantum computing, right, like uh, ML optimization. Uh, and also I was a TA for the only quantum computing class offered last year. Um, now I'm an intern at QCWare, so I am working on uh, real projects such as optimization using um, D-Wave annealers. Um, it's, it's a super fun field and I'm, I'm glad to be Great. Thank you, Mart. Uh, welcome and we're looking forward to uh, basically continuing partnership with Stanford Quantum and see more folks, both in the audience and uh, also helping with uh, 
panels and, and, and events themselves. And obviously when the world reopens, we all go, want to go to Stanford and, and enjoy kind of physical meetings as, as we used to. So welcome. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Okay. So we, are, we are trying to, uh, we're also, I, I think we talked with you about, uh, about Selexi. We're also like opening up this to Berkeley, Berkeley students as well. Uh, and uh, you, you'll probably be seeing more people from Stanford and Berkeley uh, in the following weeks. Great. Yeah, we're looking forward to that for sure. So I have a quick follow-up question for Nathan and Andrea. Um, in particular, at, the, at Stanford's Quantum Computer Association, we have a new initiative um, where we're pairing Stanford students um, with open source projects. And like pretty much like we're trying to like get people both interested who don't do quantum computing, but also those who have much experience and want to like just do something in, in terms of simulation or error correction. Um, so we're pairing them with like companies or in general like, like repos. Um, and we usually have like one engineer from like that repo come and help them out once a week. Do you think Mitik would, uh, sorry, Mitik would be interested? Do you think you guys would be interested in such a collaboration or? Well, in general, I, I think so. I think so. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, I, let, I give the words to, to, to Nathan, but I guess that sounds a very interesting opportunity. Yes. So is it like you having every week some, uh, some new guest? So yeah, exactly. We, we could reach out to that community. Yes. And again, uh, Amir uh, shared a great link for mentorship, which is uh, the Quantum Open Source Foundation is also helping pair uh, um, yes. folks uh, uh, with, uh, I mean, mentors and students or apprentices, uh, as, as you call them. And uh, yes, right, right now we're uh, also deeply involved with the review and mentorship of the Unitary Fund microgrants. So personally, I would not have time for uh, like continuous mentorship, but if it's like, you know, one off or we can rotate and we, we can come uh, and say hi, it would be great. Oh, that's perfect, yeah, thank you. And yes, and I, I'm sure you know also about this, but Another way to get uh, mentorship on projects that folks care about is uh, joining uh, a Google Summer of Code program, which now has uh, a couple of uh, quantum oriented uh, uh, projects out there. But I know you, you know about that. That's Thank, you. Thank oh, you. I, I, need, I need to rush. Thank you. It was a great uh, to meet you all. Thank you, Lex and Sebastian. Thank you, thank you, Nathan. Yeah, so you know, absolutely, guys. Uh, we we, uh, we hope to facilitate kind of the follow up from this. So maybe we should also set up a Slack or something. For now, I will share the contacts for Mitik, and we can take it from there. And thanks, Jeremiah, for asking this. I think that's exactly what kind of collaboration we want to see. Um, our second talk uh, is from uh, Daniel Mills uh, from Cambridge Quantum. Um, let's see. Uh, Daniel, yeah, so Daniel, you can present and uh, take it away. Thanks, I'll just um, grab the presentation. Okay, is that coming through? Yep, all good. Perfect. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thanks very much. So yeah, so I'm coming from London at the moment. I work for Cambridge Quantum Computing. Um, so we're a startup based in Cambridge and we work on quantum software. Um, but at, um, so we, yeah, so one of the main products we produce is a software library called Ticket, which um, facilitates um, quantum compilation and circuit design and things like this. But yeah, so I'm not here to talk about that. I'm going to talk a bit about some work I did a bit before joining CQC, actually. Um, and it'll be about ben benchmarking near-term quantum computers. Yeah, so some of the things I'll cover. So why, why should we do benchmarking in the first place? What do I mean by benchmarking? What are the challenges in benchmarking near-term devices? 
I'll explicitly talk about quantum volume, which is a benchmark introduced by IBM, which many of you will have, will have heard of. Um, discuss some of the advantages, disadvantages. Discuss some approaches to uh, addressing some of the disadvantages of quantum volume. And briefly also cover what benchmarking will look like when we have much larger devices. So first off, um, to get to why we want to do benchmarking, it's um, this leads nicely from asking the question, why are we worried about near-term devices? So these NISC devices, everybody will know about them, but so NISC is kind of like this era where we have several qubits, possibly enough to do things that we couldn't do on classical computers, but not sufficiently big enough that we can do many of the really important, really popular tasks like factoring, factoring um, and things like this. So this is the kind of regime I'm talking about in this section. Um, and we're interested in uh, these NISC devices for two reasons primarily. So firstly is that they provide this, a proof of principle demonstration that quantum computing is possible. This is, um, for example, uh, re referred to using terms like quantum computational supremacy, which is a demonstration of um, the implementation of a computation which couldn't be performed on a, on a classical device. And also, and possibly more importantly for the talk, this present talk. Um, these NIST devices help us to uh, understand which um, technologies perform best and things like this, and help us move forward into uh, the full tolerant era. Yeah, so quantum computational supremacy will come up a little bit in this talk, um, but it's just as I said, um, uh, the implementation of a computation that on a quantum computer which could not be performed on a classical one. And the second application I mentioned of near-term devices is understanding how we can move from these noisy um, intermediate scale devices, a few qubits, the qubits are kind of noisy, the connection is kind of poor. Uh, so um, how should we move from these devices to these highly connected noise-free devices? Um, and b building these small devices helps us understand which software is best, for example, which qubit technology is best, um, which connectivity should we target, uh, and things like this. So these are the two um, applications of near-term devices. And this latter one is of interest to us because once we've built these near-term devices, we can perform benchmarks and understand how they're performing to see which, one, which design is better and which will enable us to move into this fault tolerant regime. So um, that's a bit about um, why we want to do benchmarking. Um, now I'll just uh, spend a little bit of time thinking about what I'm really getting into the details of what I mean by benchmarking. So specifically a benchmarking should ask something like, is my device on track to be useful? So this is this um, idea that I mentioned about moving from these near-term devices into fault tolerant ones. So is my device I'm building on track to be becoming these fault tolerant devices? So why, why might the device not be useful? Well, of course, um, it won't be news to anybody that um, quantum, the current quantum devices are very noisy. So when you're performing some, perhaps some unitary operation, when you might expect it to result in some kind of rotation of the qubit, it might re result in some other kind of rotation. Okay, so this is just some <coughs> indication of um, noise. So yeah, so this is why a device, near to device might not be useful. So the question then is, for example, is, is benchmarking, should, should benchmarking just tell you about the gate fidelity? Would that be enough? Well, probably that isn't enough because, um, yeah. So, so there, there are there are means to gather this kind of information. So, like like randomized benchmarking, or topology, and things, um, um, or topography, for example. They you can learn this type of information, but is it really enough? Probably not, because what you really want from a quantum device is not just a bunch of 
um, um, like single qubit. So a, a well-tuned single qubit might do well at some benchmark, which is just equivalent to measuring k fidelity. What you really want is your benchmark to include um, the number of qubits you have. So you want your a, a device which performs well at your benchmark to have many qubits, um, as well as having good gate fidelity. So is, is, is benchmarking just the number of qubits times the gate fidelity then? Well, also probably not, because not only do you want many qubits, but you want them to be well connected to each other. Um, so a well connected architecture avoids you having to move qubits around a great deal and things like this. So this is another consideration. So is benchmarking then just gate fidelity times the number of qubits times the vertex degree of your architecture? Well, possibly, but there are a few things missing from this. Um, so that there's this kind of subtlety that actually the depth of the circuit you're implementing um, depends heavily on the compiler that you're using to map your circuits to the device. This in turn will impact on the noise and your device um, and the noise should certainly impact on the benchmark. So is it right that actually your benchmark should include the software that you're using? Um, yes, so it probably is. Actually, what you're hoping your benchmark will ask answer is, is the system I'm building on track to be useful? So the point I'm trying to get across with this little introduction is that when you're building a benchmark, it should um, give you an idea of how all of these things are performing collectively. So you want to know, um, you want the benchmark to include the performance of the software, to include the number of the qubits, the quality of the gates and the connections and the number of connections and things like this. And these types of benchmarks, which include a whole variety of different things, often referred to as holistic benchmarks. Um, and I might use this term often in the talk. So what are the challenges of building a benchmark? Um, so in fact, it's kind of not totally clear if when you have these very large devices that you should be able to really benchmark their performance. So, um, very, I mean, but by the very nature of um, quantum supremacy, the computation that you should be performing should be impossible to reproduce classically. So the very simple type of benchmark where you just perform the computation on a quantum computer and then reproduce the bench, reproduce the computation on the classical computer is, should be impossible. If you believe in, if you believe that um, quantum supremacy is a real phenomenon, so the main the main fear you might have when thinking about benchmarking is that actually the only way to benchmark a quantum computer is to use another quantum computer to check the results. Um, so yeah, so th this is this is the fear that you might have when thinking about benchmarking. Fortunately, I can give you a very simple um, counterexample to this. Uh, factoring, for example. So um, fa famously, quantum computers are able to, um, or a large fault tolerance quantum computer would be able to factor a large number in into its prime factors. Uh, so a benchmark that you might think of doing is to give a quantum computer a large number and ask for its prime factors. And if it does this correctly, then you can say probably the quantum computer is pretty good. So, okay, so we're kind of saved. Actually, it turns out there are some problems where you can perform some kind of benchmarking um, at just as a classical person. You don't need to fill another quantum computer to still take this. Unfortunately, we have this consideration which we introduced earlier that we, do, we don't have um, fault tolerant, full fault tolerant quantum computers. So in particular, we can't do factoring. 
um, but perhaps there is some other means of um, cheating the system. Uh, yeah. So let's just try and build such benchmark. Okay, so I'm gonna divide benchmarks into two components. So one, the first component is the circuits to run on the quantum computer. The second is the measure we use to judge if the circuits were run successfully. So fact, the factoring example I mentioned falls into this kind of division. So the circuits we're running will just be the circuits required for factoring. And the measure of successful use is are the um, numbers I'm, do the, do the numbers I'm receiving back multiply to give, together to give the number which I sent to the quantum computer. So it's kind of a binary thing. Yeah, if they do multiply together, then that's great. Um, if they don't, then that's terrible. So, so, so this, prop, this example divides into these two, get, divides neatly into this division I'm enforcing. Okay, but we exist in this world where we can't do factoring. So let's um, think a bit, a, bit, a bit more about this. So the circuits I'm going to run instead are um, so random circuits, and the computation that they perform is random circuit sampling. So the, these problems are very popular at the moment um, because it turns out that this process which I'm, of random circuit sampling, which I'm going to describe, is hard to do on a classical computer. And uh, it was these types of circuits, for example, that Google ran in their supremacy demonstration. So I'm talking now explicitly about quantum volume. So I'll talk about the random circuits that they use in that case. Um, so recall quantum volume is a benchmark introduced by IBM. And the circuits used there are of this form. So you have random two qubit rotations, which are I'm denoting by these red squares. And then you have these, these blue squ squares, which denote permutation layers. So inside these blue squares, you should imagine many, many swap, swap gates. So the cubes are just being swapped around. And then there follows another layer of um, two qubit get, random two qubit unitaries and swaps. And um, then a, <coughs> a layer of measurements. Uh, so let's pause for a second and understand why these are good circuits to run. So if you were to perform, do a good job of running this circuit, then it would show, for example, that, um, so these, these are these random two qubit unitary gates, um, being able to implement these shows you have a, um, the gates you're able to access are quite quite varied and of high quality. If you do a good job of performing this swap layer, then um, either you have a very well-connected device and you can swap very quickly, or your swap gates are of very high quality. Um, and because everything is kind of random, you're sort of benchmarking many um, elements of the device at once. So th these kind of circuits are nice because they test several features of the device at once. So performing well at implementing these device would test several important features. Um, yeah, so that's <coughs> why this is a good choice of circuits to use in the benchmark. So random circuit sampling is just the process of implementing um, this circuit forming measurements. And the measurements you get will just be zeros and ones, so they'll just be binary strings. So with each run of this, um, the circuit, you'll get a new binary string. So over time, you can, um, if you conduct the experiment many times, you'll eventually, you can imagine just counting the number of times that a particular outcome is seen. Um, so of course, over time, over many experiments, you build up this distribution of um, 
the outcomes that you've seen, um, which corresponds to the probability of the outcomes in the, um, the, the, the kind of ideal distribution. Um, yeah. So how do we measure the success of an implementation of random circuit sampling? So let's think a bit about what would be an example of a bad implementation of random circuit sampling. So if you were implementing the circuit and it was really noisy, then the tendency would be for all of the outcomes now to start um, being produced with an equal probability. So it's just becoming kind of a random uniform noise. Um, unlike in the ideal case where you have some outcomes which are very likely and some outcomes which are unlikely. So there's these two contrasting uh, cases, the ideal case where you have likely, some likely outcomes and the really no uh, very noisy case where you have no particularly likely outcomes and it's just kind of uniform. So what, what attempts at um, deriving a measure of success might be to just perform random circuit sampling, perform this kind of bucketing of the outputs uh, to see their, their likelihood, and then checking if the um, distribution of outcomes that you get is close to the, to the uniform one or close to the ideal one. So this um, has some problems. So for example, um, in order to accurately check which distribution is best matched by the distribution that are produced by the experiments, you would have to produce very many, you'd have to perform very many experiments. So um, actually it would be exponentially many because the number of possible outcomes you get would be exponential. And to check if the outputs which are unlikely um, in the original ideal distribution occur, uh, you may have to wait a very long time or, uh, to see the probability of them happening. It may be an exponential number of experiments that are required to do that. So this approach of t counting the number of times each individual output occurs is, is not going to work, unfortunately. But what might work is if you um, instead just divide the distribution into those which are very likely and those which are unlikely. Then if you count the number of times that the likely, likely outputs occur and the number of times the unlikely outputs occur, then it'll give you an idea of the accuracy because in the ideal case, you would expect there to be the likely outcomes to occur very often. Whereas if you have just converged to the uniform noise case, then the number of times that the likely outcomes occur um, is equal to the number of times the unlikely outcomes occur. Um, in particular, would be they would occur half the time. So to introduce some terminology, the outputs which are likely in the original distribution are called heavy outputs. Um, so what we're really checking here is the probability of heavy outputs being generated. And this is called the heavy output generation problem, or HOG, which you may also have come across. So the check being done is whether or not heavy outputs uh, do actually occur with high probability. So this gives us a kind of continuous spectrum. In the case where you're producing the noise-free distribution, the heavy outputs occur very often. Actually, because of the nature, the form of the distribution in the random circuit sampling case, you can calculate the probability you expect to see heavy outputs to be roughly 0 0.8. In the very noisy case, everything is produced with equal probability. So the probability that the um, outputs which are likely in the ideal distribution are produced is just 0 0.5, um, as with any other division of the distribution. 
So we have this continuous range where in the middle you can imagine some, where, some example where the heavy outputs are produced pretty often, but not as often as they should be. Okay, so this is the metric we're going to use um, to measure success, the probability of producing heavy outputs. Um, and this gets around the original problem we had because um, <clears throat> because the there aren't there shouldn't be very very small probabilities as that um, as that was occurring in the when you bucketed according to every output. So instead of checking exponentially many buckets, you're only checking two now. So uh, I skimmed, I ignored a couple of problems um, which aren't necessarily um, important, conceptually important, but I'll mention them. So calculating the value of um, the kind of halfway point, which would be like calculating the median probability of an output, um, could, you could imagine would be very challenging. Actually, it can be done. The other problem is deciding when you get an output, which of the buckets it belongs to, which is more challenging. It actually requires calculating the probability of that output having occurred in the ideal distribution and checking if it's higher or lower than the median value. Uh, this does take um, exponential time to do, but you, don't you only have to calculate this value for the number of for each experiment, which could be a polynomial number of experiments. So rather than having to calculate um, probabilities, an exponential number of probabilities, an exponential number of times, you now only need to calculate. Um, you only need to calculate a polynomial number of probabilities each for each takes an exponential time. So it becomes a bit easier. So yeah, this, um, uh, these are the prerequisites required to understand the measure of quantum volume. I'll, I'll just pause in case there are any questions um, to check. I don't know if I can see the uh, chat. But... Yeah, feel free guys to ask questions in the chat and speakers can pick them during this talk uh, when it's convenient or just ask a question when uh, there's a good time. Okay, can I, can I ask a question on this uh, method? So uh, to me, it looks very similar to the Google uh, quantum supremacy experiment, right? This kind of checking the results of, of a random. And in that case, if I'm not wrong, they use uh, kind of uh, linearized entropy or a kind of figure of merit to check if the result is what you expect. And how different is, is this method to, to your methods? Um, yeah, so, so the method I described here, I, I, I won't claim it to be this. So this is just quantum volume that's been introduced by him. So this is not introduced by me, but um, you're right. In the Google case, they use what's called cross-entry benchmarking, which is very similar. It relies on checking how, um, the pro the, how often the likely outputs occur. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's kind of subtly different. Uh, I just introduced quantum volume because it's a bit conceptually easier to understand, but it is. In that case, they explicitly calculate the probability of um, the, the average probability of the outcomes which occur um, rather than calculating the probability of the heavy outputs occurring. So it is very, it is very similar, um, but I just described quantum volume because it's conceptually a bit easier. Yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. So, so yeah, so these are the prerequisites to understand quantum volume. So quantum volume, um, what is that exactly? So you can imagine um, 
if I built random circuits in the following way. Um, so if I had two qubits, then I would have, um, I could have this small gadget, which is just the rotations and the swaps twice. And then three qubits, I would have the rotation swap layers three times. And then in general, I would have n layers of these rotation swap pairs. And you can imagine that it would get harder and harder. So as I as I as n grows, the noise would increase because I have um, deeper and deeper circuits. Um, and as the noise increases, the pro the probability of producing heavy outputs goes down. So I would um, I so the definition of quantum vo quantum volume is basically the biggest largest n for which you can, you're still capable of producing heavy outputs with a relatively high probability. Um, yeah. So, you, so as I described, as the number of qubits grows, the depth of the circuits I'm choosing to implement grows. So the probability of producing the heavy outputs should fall because it gets noisier and noisier and noisier. And then when, it cross, when the probability of producing heavy outputs crosses some value, which is 2 thirds, we call that number of qubits the quantum volume. Um, actually, you'll often hear quantum, quantum volume quoted, quoted as two to the power of that number of qubits. So for example, there was recently this demonstration of quantum volume 64 by IBM and Honeywell, um, which is uh, actually means um, like they implemented six qubit random circuits. So yeah, so I mean, just to reflect, so did it do what we wanted it to do? Well, indeed, you you needed to have um, the swap layer ensure, ensured you had good connectivity um, in general because the circuits are quite getting quite deep. Um, you required you, you were required to have good gate fidelity. Uh, as obviously, as n grows, you need more qubits, so it checks this. It doesn't really explicitly acknowledge the software you're using, though. Um, but but yeah, it does a good job. It's a nice nice benchmark to choose to use. So this is um, some examples from four IBM devices. So indeed, you see on the x-axis here the number of qubits, and then you have the heavy output probability on the side here, on the y-axis. So you can see as the number of qubits increases, you do have this fall off. And um, so the quantum volume nicely allows you to compare across these devices. Um, so yeah, just uh, some quite obvious conclusions like, so higher up is better. So higher up is the, pro the probability of producing heavy outputs, higher up is good. So you have or Orens, the Orens device in IBM is doing, doing pretty well. So let's say Orens is maybe the best device as measured by this metric. So in this case, you're only seeing heavy output generation probabilities above two thirds for uh, three qubits. So that's like a quantum volume of eight being demonstrated in this case. Um, yeah, the quantum volume 64 experiment was done on a, on a different device. Um, yeah, so some pros and cons. So, um, it kind of does what we wanted. It gives us an idea. You can compare devices and start thinking about which devices perform best. Um, it, it's, um, relate, so it's related to quantum supremacy. I haven't really discussed that, but it, uh, um, um, you can draw some conclusions about that if you perform well. Um, but it's missing a few things we might like. So it doesn't necessarily give a great indication of how to improve the device quality. Um, it doesn't necessarily give an indication of which applications the device might be better at implementing. And it's, it's kind of limited to only a few qubits. So um, as we've seen from this, like the best we've seen is quantum volume 64. So we're just tackling six qubits. Um, even though we have devices publicly available, which are you know on the order of 20 qubits. So it has, it has these drawbacks. So 
yeah, we, we tried to extend it a little bit by introducing these application motivated full stack benchmarks, um, which aims to explicitly include the compiler, um, facilitated the inclusion of what qubits, and tried to, we tried to give more of an idea of um, which applications perform best on which devices. Um, so, the, including the compiler is, um, can be done quite easily. So we, we just um, compile the circuits um, using uh, five different compilers to check their performance. Um, so yeah, so we just have we have these noise aware compilers which are which can perform compilation based on the noise models provided by the device noise unaware compilers and um, only routing, which is kind of compiling just just placement onto the architecture so that it works without any further optimization. So for example, when you optimize a circuit, you can compress things. In this case, we, we, we in the only, uh, the only um, routing case, we uh, didn't do any of that, just as a check. Um, and, and you can you can draw some comparisons about which software gives you the best quantum volume. Um, yeah, so here here we see PyTicket performing quite well, um, and um, the yeah the noise aware PyTicket is coming through. So you can say that using noise aware placement, um, noise including noise awareness in your compiler is very beneficial. <coughs> Um, and actually, in the recent work from IBM on um, the quantum volume 64 experiments, um, they made significant improvements in their compiler, and that's what actually enabled them to improve the quantum volume of their device, even without um, uh, performing a lot of improvements of the hardware. Um, so this kind of when identifying the kind of improvements you can make by using software um, can be very powerful. Um, so to increase the number of qubits we can include, um, you can, we chose to um, reduce the depth of the circuits. And you can do that in a way that isn't totally fatal by using what are called IQP circuits. So without, without going into too much detail, basically they're uh, quite, quite simple circuits. They just have um, Hadamards and commuting gates and Hadamards and measurements. So they can be very shallow and they can be optimized quite a lot because the gates commute with one another. And they also have the same um, computational supremacy guarantees or similar guarantees to random circuit sampling or at least very powerful guarantees, um, which, is, um, which is nice when thinking about quantum supremacy demonstrations. And we also chose to um, Whereas the random circuits had this permutation layer, which kind of implicitly assumed all to all connectivity, we chose to reduce the connectivity we assume to at most um, uh, three three connections. So, so there's a mistake in my drawing here. That shouldn't be four. Um, and this makes it a bit easier to compile because you don't necessarily have to swap all the qubits around uh, a great deal. Um, which makes the shallow, which once again makes the circuits shallow. So, um, yeah, we can identify the problem I'm talking about by looking back at the plot I showed earlier. So, for example, by the time we reach, so we have um, two qubits, three qubits, four qubits, five qubits. So, once time, by the time we reach five qubits, we've essentially hit the uniform, uniformly random distribution. So, we have this 0 0.5 value, which indicated uniform randomness. Which means even though Singapore, for example, has um, something like over 20 qubits, we can't really can't explore them because if we just keep adding more and more layers, it's just going to stick to this 0 0.5 value. Um, so we're kind of stuck a bit. But if we use these IQP circuits, then even uh, for larger circuits, so six and seven, we can still learn a bit about Singapore. Um, so, for example, if we think about, so here we have um, Singapore, which by the time, and the IQP circuits, by the time you reach um, five qubits, 
you're still above 0 0.5, so you can keep learning. Yorktown only has five qubits. Melbourne has flattened out already, so we can stop thinking about that. Um, Orense only has five qubits as well, sadly. So, but Singapore, we can keep learning about, um, which is great. Um, so what about after supremacy? Um, because we've, I, we've said here that um, we've used very random looking circuits, um, which isn't ideal because the circuits we really want to implement are probably very highly structured. Um, so for example, this, uh, this circuit here is kind of um, exemplifying uh, what's called the UCCSD ANSATs in variational quantum eigen solvers. So this is the kind of thing that you might want to implement to do things like finding the ground states of, um, uh, and things like that. Um, and you can see that it's, very, it's not random, it's actually very highly structured. So you have layers of um, single qubit alley gates, and then there's these ladders and things like this. So the actual circuits we really want to implement for application purposes, like in this case would be quantum chemistry, are highly structured. Um, so it might be that quantum volume is not ideal, not the ideal metric in this case. So actually we uh, discovered that if you apply enough of these Pauli circuits, the what are called, what, we call, what we'll call Pauli gadgets back to back, um, then you can recreate the kind of, um, the distribution of outputs that we had before, this dropping off distribution where you have some outcomes that are highly likely and some which are unlikely. You can, so you can recreate that distribution using these Pauli gadgets, which is enough to do something very similar to quantum volume. And indeed, if you implement um, these circuits, unfortunately, they become, they have to be very deep to be, to reproduce this curve. Um, so we can only explore up to four qubits here. But you can start to learn things um, about these devices and how they would perform when implementing particular applications. So you can see, for example, that maybe you could make claims like Orens and Singapore do, would do pretty well if you wanted to implement some kind of quantum chemistry application. So these kind of extensions allow you to make these kind of claims, which using quantum volume might not allow you to do. Um, so, that kind of solves a couple of our problems. So now we can start talking about uh, the best software to use. We can talk about the best applications and we can include a few more qubits. Unfortunately, um, we have the same scalability problem that quantum volume has, namely that you have to calculate the probability of the outcomes you see. Um, and that, that remains a problem. Um, so performing these benchmark, a benchmarking of near-term devices very efficiently is uh, still an open problem. Um, so yeah, so basically we ha have some possible extensions that might be good to consider. So um, extending to the, uh, beyond the supremacy regime, um, you might be able to use these kind of benchmarks to measure the quality of noise models. Um, so for example, if you're um, if, you, if you could simulate the expected benchmarks and the benchmarks you're getting, you might be able to learn something about the accuracy of your noise models. Uh, if we could use these, these benchmarks to perform compilation in, in place of the noise aware compilers that we used already, this could be beneficial. Um, and these benchmarks um, allow us to advise desi device designers and users of the best devices <coughs> to explore, so that would be great to do as well. Um, so <clears throat> I have said most of what I want to say. I, I will linger very briefly on the prospects for future benchmarking schemes. So we've, throughout this talk, I've lived in this um, dynamic. So I have a classical person who wants to benchmark, perform a benchmarking process with a very noisy quantum, small, small noisy quantum device. So do I gain anything, for example, if I was able to use a small noisy quantum device to benchmark another small noisy quantum device? 
Um, so actually, you can gain a bit. So the downside is you have to have a small noise performance device. But you are able to perform a benchmarking procedure efficiently. So rather than before, we had to calculate the probability of um, uh, some of the outcomes occurring. Now you don't need to do that anymore. Um, yeah, and the, the downside is you now need to perform um, some qubit communication, but, but there are schemes which allow you to do this efficiently. What about using a small noisy quorum device to benchmark a full full Toron quorum device? Um, yep, there are schemes for doing that. Uh, the, the small noisy quorum device here now needs to be a bit bigger than the one used to benchmark the other small noisy quorum device. But there are schemes to do this. But the kind of um, what we really, really want is to be able to, for a classical person to perform a benchmarking of a full fault or on quantum device. And what I want is something more than just the factoring example that I introduced earlier. I want to be able to check the quality of any computation and not just factoring. Um, actually, this is a hard problem and was open for a long time. But this too has been solved. You can check the quality of any computation. Uh, if you're willing to make some uh, computational complexity assumptions, so if you assume the hardness of some particular computations, then you can perform this process as well. Uh, so I end there. Um, just leaves me to say thanks for everybody's attention and to ref refer you to um, this paper, which constitutes a lot of the work we discussed, uh, also a lot of the work. Um, yeah, so if anybody wants also wants references to any of the other topics I covered in the talk, I would be happy to provide them. But yeah, thanks for listening. Thank you, Daniel, for the great talk. Any questions? I guess uh, it's been a long meeting. So if you guys uh, come up with questions later, you can follow up with Daniel uh, uh, separately. Um, I personally really liked it. Uh, so um, we also had some other um, um, uh, topics, right? We, uh, we had, I think, a couple lightning talks proposed. Uh, I'm not sure the uh, authors are here. And generally, you know, we have a few folks left. Uh, if you you guys want to have a general discussion, uh, uh, you're very welcome to to raise any topics. Let's see. Uh, I actually wanted to ask you guys uh, about the the format, right? So we have a settled. Uh, traditional having two talks, uh, which basically makes it half a day, right? Uh, do you think that uh, we should be doing just one talk, uh, possibly with more general discussion, or doing two talks every month is great? Any any opinion on the cadence? From anyone. Um, I, uh, I mean, I guess, uh, since the frequency of these meetings aren't too often, maybe that's the reason for the two talks. Um, I find that I would be happy with even one talk, um, mm -hmm. for, uh, and then maybe more discussion or Q and a, it, it's just a, it's a longer period of time, uh, compared to other, uh, meetings. Agreed. Agreed. That's some of the feedback we've heard. Um, and in terms of kind of mixing talks and tutorials, I think we we had pretty substantial interest in tutorials, and I guess with a lot of kind of newcomers joining um, from different communities, uh, it would probably make sense for us to to do tutorials. So if you guys want to do a tutorial, right, please let me know, so we can obviously do the kind of uh, current research reports 
but we also are very interested in tutorials. So Andrea, like I've seen, you know, uh, you guys have a lot of uh, really good materials and I think IBM has uh, learning resources and some of the folks like, like Nick Braun is in the uh, Kiski textbook, right? So, so uh, if, if you guys want to, to do a tutorial, I'd really appreciate it uh, and we can share it broadly and I guess uh, uh, invite more folks. Right, so let me know if you want to do a tutorial on uh, some of the topics you cover, right, it's leading to your work. Daniel, you're the, very welcome to kind of do a one-on-one -on, -one on, in a kind of slower pace. I think some of this, basically, and in, in same, same with Mitik, I think a lot of this can be unpacked and, you know, made into a tutorial which can be maybe run separately and maybe with a hands-on fashion with a Jupyter notebook experimentation over many couple hours, right? Which we can do differently. So, um. all right, well, so uh, uh, unless we have any other questions or comments, uh, thank you very much guys. That was a great, great meeting today and really appreciate everybody's participation and questions, uh, let me know uh, if you want to do uh, a talk uh, next month and I'll uh, invite the, the list to propose talks. We have, I think, one talk coming from UC Davis already. So maybe if we switch to uh, one talk cadence, that will be it. But then we'll have more time for lightning talks. Thank you very much. See you next time. Great, thank you all. Thank, thank you all. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you. Great day.